everyone. Thank you for joining us online here at Destiny. If you haven't had a chance to visit our campus, we would love for you to come out to either our 930 or 1130 service on Sunday. But if you can't, you can always watch us online here at destinyokc.com. And while you're there, you can look up any past messages, see any of our upcoming events, and read pastors' blogs. Also, be sure to follow us on social media right here. And now, here's this week's message. Well, good morning. You all doing well? The only thing I don't like about following, welcome each other, is you're the guy that's got to hush everybody up, right? That's enough community for one day. Sit down, right? <laughs> If you have your Bibles, why don't you grab them? We're going to start at Genesis chapter 3. We're going to just dive right in. Um, we're going to be looking at, uh, maybe better, looking at the nuts and bolts of what um, Pastor Lawrence was talking about last week in this, uh, this season of spiritual wellness. We've been looking at the orphan mentality. I'm going to kind of try to define some things. And then I want to look at some practical things, like how does this a mentality show up in our relationship with God? How does it show up with our relationship with each other? And maybe some ways you can identify it in yourself. So just be prepared to be uncomfortable for the next little bit, uh, and then hopefully we'll, we'll come back to seeing the beautiful grace of God in it. Amen? Amen. All right. Genesis chapter 3, we're going to begin at verse 7. It says, this is after they ate of the fruit, it says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. Notice that I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And then the man said, this woman whom you gave me, <laughs> you guys can talk about that now, you know, next Saturday. This woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. And then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you've done? Let's pray. Father, we are bombarded with the opinions of men. But we long for a word from you. In fact, our soul thirsts for it. So I ask you this morning, may every word not of you fall to the floor, and may every word that is ring deep within us, and may you meet with us deep unto deep. Holy Spirit, I ask you to move in this time and rush in past many of the obstacles and even walls we've built to protect ourselves and our hearts, and meet us there in the depths and let us experience your love again. We thank you for this in advance. In Jesus' name, our only hope. Amen. Um, if you have the Destiny app, you can go there and find notes. I put pretty extensive notes just because I'm going to be quoting a lot of scripture. I'm not going to try to get through all those notes, but I wanted you to have them. We've been talking about how God has made, uh, we are created to be God's sons and daughters, if you want to put it that way. And that is what's kind of framed this idea of the alternative being the orphan mentality. What we see is God makes man in his image and his likeness. That's Genesis 1.26. What we know is from John, for example, 4.24, God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So how was man made in God's image? It wasn't that when he piled the dirt together, that was his image. It was when God breathed into man. That something, in, something inside God came out of God and into man, and man became a living being. In other words, man is made in the likeness and image of God after his spirit. And we are clothed with a body. Now, this is hard for us to realize, to think about, but your body is not the most uh, deepest part of you. You were created to be a spiritual being having a physical experience, not to be a physical being trying to have a spiritual experience. And the Bible's clear all throughout the scriptures about how God has intended to have these sons and daughters. And, the, and there's plenty of passages, but just to quote some, uh, in a, uh, for example, Ephesians chapter 1 tells us when the fullness of time had come, that God had wanted to redeem and adopt his children. Galatians chapter 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth the son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem us under the law, that he may not adopt us as his sons. 
Or 1 John 1, 3, Behold what manner the love of God has lavished on us that we might be called the children of God. Adam was created with the specific intent to be God's sons. God wanted sons and daughters. We know this, for example, Luke 3, 38, in the genealogy of Jesus, says Enosh was the son of Seth, Seth was the son of Adam, Adam the son of God. So the first man and woman ever created were created with the specific intent to be God's sons and we're created with him after his spirit. Hebrews 12, 9 tells us that, that there's this God who is the father of our spirits. So they're created with that intention, but then we have the fall here, and there's a fundamental change took place in the way Adam understood himself. After Adam and Eve eat of it, they begin to realize their nakedness. There's something about their nakedness that brings, uh, that, uh, that we know they have received information from some other source than God. This is why God knows when he says, I hid because I was afraid because I was naked. He said, who told you you were naked? Where did you get that information? I didn't tell you that. In other words, maybe to put it this way, Adam and Eve were not naked as you might suppose. God made them to be spiritual beings and he clothed them with the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 3. If we'll put those passages up for me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 3. Paul says, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home, that's talking about his body, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent, speaking of the body, we groan longing to be uh, put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, that's the body, we groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, that we would put off mortality, be swallowed up in life. He calls the body a tent. Anybody that's ever been camping knows the difference between a tent and a person in the tent. So just, that's good news. When you look in the mirror, you could just say, this is not the deepest me. <laughs> right? Anybody else? Right. Like these are just clothes, and they're really good clothes. They cooperate with gravity. They take water in. They can let water out at certain times. They can do all kinds of things, right? So when Adam and Eve, when they sinned, though, something fundamentally changed about the way they saw themselves. They were deceived into thinking that they were flesh and they needed to be further clothed. That tells us a fundamental shift in how they understood themselves to be. They were no, no longer spiritual beings who were clothed in the flesh. They saw themselves as primarily flesh, and that's why they needed to further clothe themselves. Where did you get the idea that you clothe things? Well, from God, because God had clothed their spirit with a body. And then they seek, imagine for a moment when you realize and you think you're just flesh, how vulnerable you feel. You realize you can be hurt. You realize that you need food. You realize that other people can hurt you. You realize that you can die. And all of a sudden you see this preoccupation with hiding and and covering their vulnerability. You see a whole other different way of being arise the day that they ate of it. They're no longer A son, thinking of a son being a spiritual being, being made in the image of God, clothed with the flesh, but they begin to think like an orphan. So let's maybe examine a little bit what uh, orphan mentality would look like. This root identity of being an orphan is I am all I have. It's one rooted in being vulnerable, feeling vulnerable and alone. In other words, everybody then becomes a potential threat. They're either a resource that I should use or they're a potential threat and can be an enemy. I mean, fundamentally, this shift in Adam and Eve affected everything they relate to. It affected God. They hide from him. It affects one another. This woman you gave me, I mean, just think about it. Before the fall, right, Adam looks at her and says, bone of my bone, right, flesh of my flesh, you are woe men. (laughs) After he falls, he looks at God, this woman you gave me. He blames the only other two people on the planet. Right? It's not paranoia if it's true. Right? This woman you gave me. Right? Now, you know Eve was a powerful woman. Can you imagine the conversation outside the garden the next day? <laughs> this woman, huh? <laughs> Let's have a conversation. <laughs> but it affects the way they relate to one another. He no longer sees bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. He sees her as wholly separate, other. It affects the way they even deal with creation. This belief system is rooted in all I have and it it, it anticipates lack so much so that it becomes preoccupied with the flesh and this preoccupation turns into what the Bible calls a lust. All a lust is is a preoccupation with a desire that becomes so strong that it begins to negate all other desire. 
And they become preoccupied with, the, uh, as First John 2 would say, the lust of the flesh. What is it my flesh needs? The lust of the eye. How do I figure out, how do I see what it is? I, how, how do I, can I, let me figure out how I can meet my need. And then the pride of life is the pride of being able to meet my need myself. That after the fall, the orphan mentality is marked by our flesh, center of our reality, and trying to find a way to meet its needs. This leads then an orphan to give up Think about this. This leads an orphan to the preoccupation with survival when he was created by God to have dominion. Let's compare it to what it may look like to be a son, to, to have the identity of, of being made in the image and likeness of God. The root identity of a son is, is I am accepted. I am accepted in the beloved and not by works but by grace. That God made me. I didn't even choose to be made. He made me because he wanted me. And then there's this deep sense of God's love for me is not based on my performance, it's based on his character. There is nothing I can do to make God love me less and there's nothing I can do to make God love me more. Because he doesn't love me based on my performance, he loves me based on his character. Now every parent knows that can be true. That doesn't mean you don't want to see the other change or that change is necessary. It just means there's a total unconditional acceptance of the other as they are. Imagine having that as our root identity. Why would God make sons? What, what reason are sons given? I want you to see this because I want you to see the, de- the depth of the fall. Isaiah 9, you remember we quoted at Christmas time, for unto us a child is born but a son is given. And why was a son given? That the government may rest upon his shoulders. God makes sons and daughters. Let's pause for a minute. When I say sons from here on out, just want you to know, you are made in the image and likeness of God after your spirit. Everybody say Spirit. That's why Galatians 3 can say, there is now in Christ, right, for anybody that's Christ or sons of God, there's neither, Jew nor, uh, there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave or free. Now think about that for a moment. There is neither male nor female. We are used to sons not being female, but it says they are neither male. Why? Because your gender is after your flesh, but you're a child of God after your spirit. And your spirit is not gender specific news for you there. Oh, wow, I dove off in the deep end, didn't I? I can see you guys looking at me. Oh, so let me put it this way. Ladies, when I say sons, you work on being sons, and men will work on being the bride of Christ. How does that work, all right? So when I say sons, I'm not trying to make any kind of gender-specific claim here. I'm talking about all of us. So why was a son given? To carry, in a sense, to represent the kingdom of God to be bearers of God's kingdom, to be representatives. Hebrews chapter one, right? The son was given, he was the, he was the radiance of the father's glory. He was the exact representation of his nature, of his character. We, God gives sons because he desires, the invisible God desired to be made known in the earth. In other words, we were created with a specific intent, made in his image and likeness, in order to have stewardship, dominion, rulership, uh, uh, custodialship in the legal sense, if you wanna use that word. We were made to represent God in the earth to put God on display. And therefore, when you're a son of God and you're after uh, seeking first the father's business, which is his kingdom, the resource of a son is the resource of his father's house. Now imagine that. God creates us with a specific intent to be his sons, to put him on display, but after the fall, now Adam and Eve are just seeking and preoccupied with their survival. This is a pretty great fall. It changes everything. Maybe let's compare right quick. If you have that comparison, would you mind putting it up side by side? Just a quick comparison. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. There we go. Uh, Maybe the orphan mentality has flesh as the center of reality. Its root identity is I am all alone, I am all I have. It feels vulnerable, which then seeks to hide it. So oftentimes the... um, It can be vibrato that they're not vulnerable. Uh, Seeks provision, seeks protection. That's a preoccupation they have. Then there's a culture of survival. They become very exchange-oriented. This for that kind of thinking. Nothing's for free. This, this for that. Or as the Irish say, tit for tat. Right? Uh, expects lacks and therefore hoards, seeks approval from others. But compare that to a son who has the spirit of the center of reality, his root identity is I'm accepted. He feels secure even though he's as vulnerable as any other human being. He seeks first the kingdom of God. That would be the father's business. Again, he comes from a culture of rulership or dominion. I'm not trying to simply survive. I am actually going to be held accountable in how I steward the things in my possession. 
He learns to receive inheritances. In other words, the father provides for what he needs. A son can be disciplined because he knows he's significant. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that a son, anybody who's never experienced the discipline of the Lord is not a son, it's illegitimate son. Why? Let me tell you the difference between discipline and punishment. Punishment is always forced, uh, focused on the past. You did this and now you're going to pay. Discipline is always focused on the future. God disciplines his sons because he has a vision for them in mind. That is to share in his glory and to put him on display. So a son can receive discipline because he knows he's meant to be significant. He can live vulnerable and free and he seeks impact. By that I mean he doesn't seek what he can get from others, he seeks what he can contribute to others. It's just a brief overview. Now I wanna really mess with you a little bit if I can, for the glory of God. <laughs> Let's talk about how an orphan might relate to God. So this orphan mentality is preoccupied with their own provision and protection. And then you find out there's a God. Well, this God is the ultimate one that can provide you provision and protection, right? So oftentimes when an orphan begins his relationship with God, this orphan mentality enters into relationship with God based on some sort of exchange model. How can I get what I need from God so I just need to give God what he wants from me? Now, think about this when it comes to any kind of exchange, any kind of um, trade. Take, um, just to keep it simple, take uh, buying a car. All right, let's say I had a car, and let's say you have cash. Right? Those are two uh, different objects, and you spend them different ways. You spend cash different than you spend a car. We don't even talk like that, but you, you do. So we got to find out how much cash is worth car and how much car is worth cash so that we can have some sort of equal exchange, right? Well, we can go to a Kelly Blue Book. Shows how old I am. All of a sudden, I realized that reveals probably a little. We go to a Kelly Blue Book, and we can figure out how much cash approximately is worth car and how much car is worth cash so that we can make sure that the rate of exchange is all right. When an orphan enters relationship with God, they often go to the Bible like it's a Kelly Blue Book. Tell me the rate of exchange, God. What must I do to get you to protect me? What must I do to get you to give me that new job? What must I do to get you to make sure no one hurts me? What must I do? Okay, don't cuss. <laughs> All right, go to church. But listen, my friends. When you want to exchange with God... At least at the point of exchange, there's God and there's you. At least at the moment you are going to exchange something with God, you actually have to believe that what you have is of equal value to what God has given you. And that, my friends, is self-righteousness and pride. We don't have anything of equal value than what God gives us. Just relax for a moment. But to think you can exchange, to think not cussing is worth a promotion? I mean, just, I know we don't, maybe you, you look all really spiritual, and maybe you don't think this way, but there's people that do in a galaxy far, far away, right? They skip their quiet time, they go outside, there's a flat tire, they say, oh man, I should have prayed, I knew it, right? Or the washing machine breaks down, like God's in there waiting to see if they pray, and he's going to mess up their washing machine. That's an, that's an orphan entering into a relationship with God. Tell me what the rate of exchange is. Tell me what I must do. Right? It's different. Say, in my, I go to my dad and I say, Dad, when I, let's say I live in the house and I go to dad and say, Dad, I want to borrow the truck. He says, great. By the way, did you take the trash out like, like I asked you to? No, I'll get right on it. I'll take the trash out. And I come back and dad says, hey, change of plans. I got a phone call. I'm going to need the truck. Sorry, you can't have it tonight. I don't go, I'm suing you. You said if I took the trash out, I'd get the truck. No. Well, because it was never based on exchange. It was the father's house. Do you see? So an orphan will enter into a relationship with God. Now think about this. Now compare that to what a son would do. A son learns to receive his inheritances as a gift. And when there's discipline or when there's moments of pause, that's okay. I didn't deserve any of this anyway. Now, at the, the way God wants to relate to us as sons is through the appeal to love or asking or what we call prayer. Prayer is how sons engage with God to access the resource of God for God's purposes in their life and in the earth. 
In other words, listen, what an orphan mentality does is it locks you into legalism or some form of exchanging with God that makes you trying to earn what God already wanted to give you for free if you would just come to him as a son. It's deception, and it is deceiving. That's a truism, sorry. Do you get it? So, locks us into relating with God because of this preoccupation. This orphan mentality affects our relationship with God, but not only that, it affects our relationship with one another. And this is where I want to spend some time to try to help make sense of this, and I'm going to try to use a whiteboard. We'll see how well this works. Uh, I do need somebody uh, in the back. If you can't see, you can just yell at me. I just want to make sure, but... I want to just talk to you this way. I want to break it down to four basic needs. We all have four basic needs. Now listen, we have much more needs than this. Obviously we have need for food. I'm talking about more emotionally and spiritual needs. There's far more exhausted. Today I just want to focus on four because these four are pretty big, right? These four needs are security, the need for unconditional acceptance, which we tend to call love when we experience it. So I'm going to try it. Everybody tell me if you can see it. So we're going to go security, Oh no, I have this horrifying idea that I'm going to misspell everything all of a sudden. All right, security, I'm going to abbreviate unconditional acceptance. Um, we have a need to feel value. That is that I, am, I have worth regardless of what I do. God made me in his image and likeness and I have worth because I'm, I, am, I exist. And then the last one uh, for today would be significance. I need a new marker already. We're going to put sign, but we have a value to be significant. Years ago in 1990, Harvard did a study where they actually took people, and they took 40 people, and they paid a minimum wage to come in the morning, and they dug a hole. They broke for lunch, and they came back, and they filled up the hole. They did that for a week, and they said, come back next week. We'll double your pay. Only half the people came back. Only 20 people came back. 20 people came back, dug it in the morning, went to lunch, filled the hole back up. They said, if you come again, we will double it again. Only two people showed up. Why? Because there comes a moment where money no longer motivates you. You want to know what you're doing has some sort of significance in the world. And digging a hole and filling it back up is not worth wasting your life no matter the money you get paid. We have a deep, intrinsic desire. But this is what tends to happen. We tend to, hope everybody is good with this so far. You know what? I'm already going to erase this. I can see. All right. This is a, oh boy. All right. God really wants you to get these four things. <laughs> so we all have the, uh, I need to write bigger. We all have these needs. I'm just going to do an N. We all have these needs. Usually at some point in our lives, these needs go unmet. I'm just going to do UN. Un, I'll put it down here, met. Usually by parents or siblings. Listen, as long as parents are made out of people, they're going to be imperfect. All right, so just, this is not, I'm not attacking anybody, but normally it's those closest to us where these needs go unmet. And sometimes even abuse is applied. That is, instead of just not meeting the need, we, somebody intentionally does harm to make sure the opposite is given. If you don't think you have these four needs, I want you to think about how much time you try to uh, spend avoiding the opposite of these. How much time do you spend trying not to feel insecure? How much time do you spend trying to not feel rejected? How much time do you spend trying to not feel worthless? How much time do we spend trying to not feel insignificant? The problem is, avoiding the opposite of these is not the same thing as having them met. So we have these unmet needs. This tends to lead to what we call a wound, big W. We get wounded, which leads to pain. That is not a pleasant experience, is it? To experience that kind of uh, hurt. The problem is, right here, what begins to happen? Right here, this tends to, I'm going to go this way, I'm going to go now backwards, leads to fear. Oftentimes, if you'll listen to me, your deepest fears are unprocessed pain. Because it goes something like this. If the people that said they love me the most cause this much pain in me, what is the rest of the world going to be like? And then what tends to happen is this fear leads to some sort of form of control. How do I control my environment to make sure I don't experience this again? Now, there can be sweet ways of manipulating and controlling others. 
And they're going to be sour ways, sweet ways. I'm going to give you three or four, so you'll give me one. That's the unspoken contract. I've got to be real nice, but then eventually you'll give it to me, right? If not, then you're just really selfish, stupid, and wicked, right? I'll give a classic one after the love language thing come out, right? I did your love language. Not time for you to do mine. <laughs> then it wasn't love. It was another way of controlling the other. I feel like I'm, I'm preaching better than you guys are responding. <laughs> right? But this is what happens. We try to control. We can try to control in all kinds of ways. We can, we can try to control through being aggressive. We can try to control through the way we present false selves to people or even the best parts of ourselves and hide the worst parts of ourselves. We do all kinds of things trying to control the way people see us. Now, what's important to remember is God made you with these needs. God made you with them. And God intends for these needs to be met. And he has a promise to meet them. Now, he intends to usually meet them through people. But he intends to meet them. I remember one time sitting with a married couple. And uh, uh, they were talking back and forth. And he said to her, tell me one need that you have. And she said, she just looked, she said, I have no need. I'm fine. I don't, have, I don't need anything from you. And I turned to him and said, how is it being married to God? <laughs> Needs are the way you know you're not God. And it may seem, especially somehow to Christian women, that trying to have no needs is somehow super spiritual. It's idolatry. You are not God. And he made us with needs and he intends to meet them. The problem is what we begin to do now is we begin to try to orchestrate and control to try to get these needs met so we can not experience this kind of cycle again. How do I not experience this pain again? Then the deception can go so far that we try to find a way to meet these needs without having to even involve people. Anybody else? You just get to the point where it's like people. You know, I could be a saint of God on a desert island. You know, it's just people that are the problem. And so we try to do. We try to find security in our possessions. If my 401k is just big enough, or if I'm successful enough, people will leave me alone. If I achieve enough, no one will bother me. We try to get acceptance, often gets transferred something like passions. If I'm desired, then I'm accepted. No, being lust after is not the same thing as being accepted. Being attractive is not the same thing as being known. And we try to get the needs met um, through value. We try to get value through position. Don't you know I'm a lawyer? I'm a doctor. Don't you know how important I am? Don't you know the things that I do? And somehow position gives us value. I don't need other people to meet these needs. I met them myself. Then oftentimes when we live that way, this is the most significant thing about our life is we try to just make sure to protect these other things. So the most significant thing is how do I keep these in play? How do I protect them? This is what an orphan looks like in relationship with other people. They're trying to survive the relationships by controlling the world around them, right? But here's the deal. The fundamental lie that the orphan believes is that no one could or would love them enough to meet their needs. No trust, no intimacy, just a lot of isolation and loneliness, though an orphan can hide it really well. But the problem is an orphan still has these needs. So listen, my friends. What God often wants to do with us is he wants to take us back to here. And he wants to meet us here. And then what he wants to do is he wants to show us how in trusting of his love he'll take ownership and responsibility for our needs. And this is what I'm trying to tell you is this is functionally how the Father's love heals you. You cannot outperform inward shame. There is not enough achievement, there is not enough accolades to heal the hurt in your heart. Even if you become really pr proficient at manipulating the world around you to get these needs met, they ultimately will not meet them because you know these needs were created to be met by love and in the process of love. 
And if you manipulate others to even get these needs met, it will not satisfy for you know you've manipulated the situation to get the need met and that the other person on the other end is not lovingly and freely choosing to move towards you and meet these needs. But the good news is that the Bible clearly tells us that God wants to meet our needs. Philippians 4.19, Paul says, may, may my, uh, uh, my God shall supply all your needs, every need that you have, every need, not according to the size of your need, not according to how spiritual you are. My God, Philippians 4.19, will supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Jesus Christ. Or how about this one, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. We talked about this, I think, when we talked about giving. My, Paul says, God, uh, God will make all grace abound to you, that, it, that you have all sufficiency in all things at all times for every good work. A son learns to trust the love of the father as the source for his security. No matter what the world does to me, the world is a perfectly safe place for me because God will work all things out for my good. Even if it's my death, he'll work it out for my good. I, God becomes the source of my unconditional acceptance. There is nothing I can do to make God love me more or make God love me less because his love for me is based on his character and not my performance. I am accepted in the beloved. Mm. God becomes the source of our value. I, I, A.T. Hargrave, not I as a general human being. I was made in the image and likeness of God. That's got to have some resounding effect. <laughs> I have value because God knew me before I was even born. I am known and remembered by God. I have value and worth that no one can take away. It's intrinsic to who I am. And I am significant. Why? Because I've been put on the world, in the earth, to put God on display on the areas around me that he's given me influence over to see his kingdom come and his will be done so everything I do has eternal implications. And that is significant. Now you see, I'm actually free to love others. I don't need fear to be my motive. Love will never be the functional dynamic in a relationship when fear is the ultimate motivation. Now I'm actually free to love people. Because whether they choose to meet my need or move towards me or not, it's all right. I know there is an undiluted river that flows towards me and God. That regardless of what the other person does, God can either work in their life or he can orchestrate circumstances around me. But God will meet my need for he is faithful to me. Now I'm free to love. I'm not free to love like, like you know, bait and switch. I love you, I love you, I love you. My turn. I'm free to love. So it, this is the Father. Listen, even if we're trusting God with this and we get wounded again, the good news about this is nothing can harm me more than my Father can heal me. Come on. So bring the best shot. It may be painful, but that's okay. There's worse things than pain. All right. So God has purposed and he ultimately desires to meet these needs. And we have to kind of get out of this cycle. So when God created us with these needs, his intention was to meet them. But oftentimes we get into this process and God wants to often take us back to wounds which are hard because we have to feel pain, right? We kind of, we don't even, we could, I don't even think you have to be that articulate about what's happening here. But what we want to do is we want to go back and make ourselves vulnerable to the love of God again. So that God can meet us there. Well maybe, uh, as, how do you recognize some of these things in you? Let me give you just a couple ways you can recognize them in you, and then I want to conclude. One is um, areas of your defensiveness. Where do you get defensive? Right? Where does somebody call you touchy? Right? Maybe put it this way. This is what I mean by defensiveness. Where is your response um, improportionate to what has happened? Something's happened, but your response has escalated way above it. That's a great way to tell you're being defensive. Like, you can, you can handle all kinds of things over here, but this one gets touched, and all of a sudden, your, your, your response is, again, out of proportion. It's, it's out of balance to what's actually taking place. 
So our defensiveness is a great way to find places where the, we're probably relying on something as part of our core identity. Probably a way we're trying to get some needs met in an unhealthy way. Right? You often, you can tell you're starting to recognize this. Have you ever had, had been driving down the road or leave a conversation and go, what? What, is, what causes me to respond that way? Why did I feel the need to defend myself? Why did I feel the need to tell the person I knew that person? Why did I feel the need to, do you see what I'm saying? All right, defensiveness. Second way you can identify it is areas of compulsions. Look, we all have compulsions, that's part of life. What I mean by that is just things we, we feel like we have to do, even though we don't actually have to do them. Now, again, somebody can go too far in that and be, have a disorder about it, but in the end, we're all compulsive at some level about certain things, right? It can be success, it can be esteem, cleanliness is a big one, right? Uh, appearance, uniqueness, right? Listen, I'll just tell a story on myself. One time, I was busting up a, uh, I was building a deck, so I busted up a bunch of concrete and I'm hauling it off. I had laid concrete for the poles. I put all the poles in place, and I am just a feel. Anybody ever uh, broken up concrete? You know the dust, right? It just covered in dust, and I realized I still needed a, a particular part at Home Depot soon, right? Or, or from some hardware store soon. And they're, uh, they're talking with someone. I said, uh, they said, well, just run to the store and get it. And I said, I can't go to Home Depot like this. And the person said, you can't go to Home Depot looking like you're working on your home. Now listen, I was about 22, and I just want to tell you, I actually took a shower, got dressed, and went to Home Depot. And on my way to Home Depot, I went, Lord Jesus, this is a, I need you to save me. No, I'm serious. There is something here. I am so invested in how I appear. This is unhealthy. I need you to meet me here and save me. What are some of your compulsions? Right. You're fine, but better not be a twinge of disrespect in the comment. What, what is it? What kind of compulsions do you have? Compulsions tend to represent excessive attachments to things and usually give way to where we might be tempted with idolatry and putting other things above God. Now listen, I'm not... Uh, anyway, they often exist to protect you. So the third way is what is necessary for you to maintain whatever usual amount of stability and peace you have in your life? Like you have peace, everything's kind of going good, but the moment one or two things get tweaked, you just lose your cool. Anybody else? What are those things? You can endure a lot just as long as it's not touching there, right? I can endure a lot of disrespect as long as I got plenty of money in the bank. I can endure a lot as long as I know my kids are okay. I can endure a lot as long as I know I have my health. What is it that you, you have to have in order to feel at peace? Now listen, I'm not saying these things are wrong. I'm saying these things can often become places that we are vulnerable. We experience our vulnerability and we are tempted to trust in them more than God. Okay. It's a dangerous thing, isn't it, to, especially with children, to feel like God is saying, will you trust them to me? And it's like, I remember, I'm just gonna be honest with you. I would go in, pray, pray with my kids. Lord, give them a heart to know you, to walk in their, your ways. May they pour their lives out for your glory. God, may they, they, their lives be a sweet-smelling aroma to you. And then I leave their bedroom, I go in my room and say, oh, God, spare their souls. Please don't send them to like Uganda. <laughs> uh, you're all, that was a very nervous laughter, like, I think I know what he's talking about. Well, let me just maybe end with the story that may help us. Peter, in the Bible, throughout the Gospels, has an interesting transition uh, time that helps us better understand maybe how this process of healing will work. Peter, come, he came to experience the depths of God's love by having to go through experiencing the depths of himself as God knew him. You don't know who you are until you know the you God knows. So in Matthew 4, you find Peter. He goes to his brother Andrew and he says, Come, we have found the Christ. We have found the Messiah. That is depth of conviction. He actually believes something particular about Jesus. He's the Messiah. Come, we found him. Now, though he may believe that, he probably hasn't come to experience it yet. Fast forward a little bit, then you have uh, Peter walking on water. Peter gets to the place where he says, Lord, if you bid me come, 
I will come to you. In other words, he's now so confident about who Jesus is that if Jesus urges him to walk on water, he can do what he knows he otherwise cannot do. Bid me come and I'll come. That's what he knows about God. And so he's able to step out of the water. And everybody says, well, yeah, but he, you know, he's saying, yeah, but there's 11 or more other dudes still in the boat. So give him some credit. Then you get to John 13 where Jesus says, Peter, I need to wash your feet. And Peter says, no, don't, don't do that, Lord. And he says, well, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. Right? Then Jesus says, tonight the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will scatter. You're all going to betray me. But Peter, Peter, stand up when you should be sitting down, Peter. Right? Peter with foot-shaped mouth. Peter who, you know, switchblade carrying Peter that chops the guy's ear off, which he can't, he wasn't aiming for his ear. Right? That Peter says, no, Lord, they may all leave you. I'll die with you. And it's as if Jesus has got to confront his pride. And he says, Jesus, Jesus turns to Peter and says, I'm going to predict, Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. You know, what's interesting is Peter's denial is one of the few stories that's in all four Gospels. You know Peter had to love that, right? <laughs> Let's be honest. Really, guys? You had to keep that one in there, you know? Again, did you see <laughs> Matthew and Mark? Like, hey, don't forget Peter's denial. Oh, yeah, Peter's denial. <laughs> all four Gospels, it, it, it mentions that after the third time he betrayed Jesus and the rooster crowed and he remembered what Jesus had said. Mark's version, I think, is the most uh, strong in Greek. When he brought to his mind what had happened, he ran out and wept bitterly. <laughs> On the night that Jesus dies, Peter's experiencing his own death. See, how Peter understands himself to be is now broken. The loyal, courageous brute of a man on the very night that his Messiah needed him the most, he betrayed not only his Messiah, he betrayed himself. Now imagine what he's like. The self-loathing, the doubt, the inward conflict, absolute chaos, He's filled with brokenness. Now he's nothing more than a broken brute. A couple days later, a couple of hysterical women come running and say, we've seen Jesus, he's alive. You see, the resurrection of Jesus also meant the resurrection for Peter. Peter has had an encounter with Jesus prior to the, this fishing story I'm about to tell you, but he's always been with Jesus in groups, and then one day they're out on the lake fishing, and Jesus shows up on the shore, and he says, Peter, or, throw your net on the other side of the boat. They do, and John leans over to Peter and says, it's the Messiah, it's him, and Peter doesn't waste any time. If you remember the story, he throws off his cloak, jumps in the water, the frigid water of an of a Israel morning, Israel morning, and he, he swims to Jesus just to be alone with him. He hasn't had a moment alone since he's betrayed him. And the Bible says when he gets there, Jesus had fixed a coal made of fire. The only other time that fire is ever mentioned in the entire New Testament is on the night Peter betrayed Jesus. He warmed his hand next to a coal of fire. Jesus is going to heal Peter, but that doesn't mean it won't be painful. And he makes this coal of fire. And can you hear the sting in Jesus' question to Peter? Peter, do you love me? What you see in Peter's voice is the vibrato is gone. He's broken. He doesn't lead with, yes, Lord. He leads with, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. And then he begins to restore Peter. Look, Jesus' love for Peter never changed from Matthew 4 to John 21. What changed was as Peter experienced the depth of his brokenness and vulnerability, as he came to terms with how wounded of a soul he really was, he turned and saw a different depth of Jesus' love for him. Jesus' love didn't become greater. Peter's awareness of his own brokenness became greater, and that led to a greater experience 
of the depths of God's love. Listen, the very things you're trying to hide from God may be the very invitation God's trying to give you to come to a new experience of the depth of his love. So by hiding your vulnerability, you're actually just hiding from love and hiding from God. I want to ask the worship team to come. Peter will no longer be known by his fear, nor by his strength, nor by his pride. He'll now be known by his love. The question for Peter was not, do you feel bad for what you did? Before he, thank you gentlemen, before he's restoring Peter, listen, before he's restoring Peter to a ministry, he's sending him out to feed his sheep. He doesn't ask, do you feel qualified? What have you learned from your experience? The core question to it all, do you love me? Do you love me? And he comes to experience more of God's love and in return, more of his love for God by experiencing the depth of his brokenness in light of God's love for him. Similar to Jesus' parable, who loved much? The man who was forgiven 500 or the man who was forgiven 50? So look, knowing God's acceptance of you is not the same thing, though, as coming to trust in God's love to meet your future needs. And what I want to say is just this. If you'll hear me right here, big point. Transitioning from experiencing God's love as acceptance of you to trusting God's love for future provision is one of the main challenges of all discipleship. How do I transition from just knowing that I'm accepted and loved by God to trusting in that love for the provision tomorrow? Whether it's security and acceptance and significance and value, or money, or key contacts, or fruitfulness, coming to trust God's love in the future. And that transition is one of the most challenging places of discipleship. And what I'm hoping to tell you is God's love will transform us and meet us there when we meet him in the depths of our brokenness. He will heal us there. And that will move us to better learning to trust and rely upon him for tomorrow. So your GP2RL for this week. Would you ask God to help you? GP2RL means God's presence to real life. One of the practices for this week, ask God to help you see what makes you feel most vulnerable and then discuss with God. I want everybody to hear me really. I am not encouraging you into introspection. You can go search your soul and find the worst parts of you, but what are you going to do about it? nothing I'm asking you this is not about introspection this is about a conversation with the father this is not about therapy or self analysis right now this is about prayer where I meet God so if you just dive in and go inward you're going to miss the point the point listen it's not near important what you think about your woundedness or brokenness or your unmet needs it doesn't it's not near as important as you get a glimpse of what God thinks about it that's where the healing takes place So when you bring that to God, have a conversation with him about it. Would you stand with me? One of our convictions here at Destiny is that part of the way we respond to God as a community is to respond in worship. So we're just going to take a moment.
just take a moment and let's worship together.